last time. Uh, on the right. And uh, now it was always possible for men to 
passes women in the real world, you know, to cross-dress or to otherwise modify your appearance, or nowadays even have surgery. Uh, but, um, but it's much easier to do so online uh, than it is to do so offline. So, you know, that old New York cartoon on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Uh, you know, this, you know, you can adopt a different identity online than you have in real life, and it's much easier to do so uh, using this technology. Now, um, and this is one of the most poignant photographs to me. I, I just think about this pair of images all the time. It, it, it breaks my heart. It, it seems to break my heart more than it does people of your generation. I, I don't know why exactly, but in the set of photos that Mr. Cooper obtained, here, of course, is a boy on the left. Uh, and those of you that um, know any medicine or are familiar with this at all can see that this boy is actually probably paralyzed from the neck down. His hands are all contracted and emaciated. He's wearing a CPAP mask that helps him breathe because his fracture is sufficiently, his uh, neck transection is sufficiently high that uh, he can't even breathe unassisted. So this boy has, has had a devastating neurologic injury. And look at the avatar that he makes. It just brings tears to my eyes, actually. You know, if you were this boy, who would you be picking in violent, you know, steel encased, strong, able bodied, you know, avatar? And so this is, this is uh, what he picks. And so, so he can do that. You know, he can pick this kind of an avatar online, uh, mobile and immune uh, from injury. So the internet has some things that are actually a little bit uh, different. Well, let's take a look at, the, at some of these features. Uh, let's start with this issue of scale. This is a natural social network of 105 college students and who their friends are in a particular college dorm. Every dots a person, reliable person presents a relationship, and here are who are whose uh, real friends. Okay, these are like face-to-face -face, uh, friendships, and on average, each person has about six and a half friends in the, uh, this little uh, network uh, graph. And here's what happens when you add whether they people in green, whether the people are members of the same ethnically based club as well. So the white lines indicate real friendships, and the green lines indicate that both kids are in the same uh, club. And here's what happens when you add roommates uh, in blue. Let me see if I can find my, uh, my, uh, my laser pointer. There we go. So, uh, so the reason I wanted to bring up my laser pointer is I wanted to highlight this little connection here. These two guys are roommates, but there's a blue line, but there's no white line. They're not friends. Uh, that's like a serious problem that maybe you're probably familiar with uh, in college life, okay? So in network science, this is known as multiplexity, the fact that you can have different sorts of ties with people. So for example, friends with benefits is another example of that. Uh, so you can have both a personal friendship relationship with someone and a sexual relationship, or they can be independent of those two kinds of things, and you can graph those in a network in, uh, in different uh, sorts of ways. Or you can add to these three kinds of ties, uh, Facebook ties uh, in red. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and here, on average, people have 110 Facebook friends, even though, as I told you, this data set is so old now. Most of you guys have 600, 700, some of you, thousands of so-called friends. These are not actually the real friends, just to tell you they're nearly acquaintances. But anyway, uh, you have 110 Facebook friends and uh, six and a half real friends. And here's what happens when you expand the whole college class of 1,700 kids. So you get a tremendous amount of, of, of complexity, like this enormous, complex spaghetti uh, noodle kind of, you know, ramen noodle kind of uh, mixture that looks like a complete uh, uh, gamish. And this profusion of data actually can be overwhelming. So for both analytical and conceptual reasons, we need a way to discern which of these ties, embedded in all these ties, are real old-fashioned friendships. Because in fact, Facebook friends and other sorts of online connections can indeed be very tenuous. And the question is, do they influence us in the same way as real face-to-face -face relationships? Are you affected as much by a Facebook interaction and a Facebook friend as you are by a real face-to-face -face friendship? Now, among other techniques that we use when we process using big data techniques, we've done this for whole countries, millions of people connected to each other, billions of we just had a paper last week using 100 million people in this United States. And anyway, well, there are a variety of ways that we can do this. One of the ways that we did it is, is we used, in this particular project, uh, picture friends. 
So we said that we're going to define a real friend of yours as someone who uh, has been co-tagged with you in a photograph with fewer than, uh, let's say, five or ten other people. Um, and that's to reduce the fact that, you know, a, a photograph of, of you and one other person where both of you are tagged, you took the photo, you took it back to your website, uh, computer, you uploaded it and tagged it, that's a different kind of relationship than you have with all your other Facebook friends. And it's also different than the kind of relationship you might have with, you know, 50 people at a concert or something where random people are, are being tagged. So, and when you do that, you find that, in fact, people have about six and a half real friends, just like we said at the beginning, if you look at picture friends in, in this data set. And then we became interested in whether these tenuous Facebook relationships uh, and similar internet interactions had the same influence as real face-to-face -face friendships. And we studied whether any old Facebook friend could affect your taste in music, movies, or books. Uh, and for example, here are the top 10 movies in this college-age population in this sample. Probably you'll recognize most of those movies. Uh, and not surprisingly, Lord of the Rings is at the top, at least to me, not surprising. Um, and, um, and, uh, and we found that if any old Facebook friend of yours expressed an interest in one of these movies, it did not affect the probability that you would become interested in that movie uh, in the future. But if one of your picture friends, one of your real friends embedded into the network expressed an interest in one of these movies, it did affect the probability that you would, in the subsequent point in time, also pick this as one of your favorite movies, uh, but only for these three movies, uh, Good Will Hunting, uh, Pulp Fiction, and Love Action. Uh, and if we then take the data and graph the data, what we find is, is that the network of movie tastes is very polarized. So here in yellow, we put the Love Action fans. In red, we put the Pulp Fiction fans. There are very few fans of both uh, in orange. And they're located structurally right at the border between the two clusters of Pulp Fiction and Love Action fans. Now, um, and so uh, you can tell, first of all, that there's this clustering. And this is similar, incidentally, to the clustering that we saw the last time when we looked at obesity and smoking and happiness uh, clusters of, uh, you know, uh, in real place space networks. Here now occurring, however, with, uh, with respect to movie tastes. Now, businesses uh, nowadays think that uh, marketing companies, and some of you may be interested in this topic, think that if you could just identify central people in a network and target them, like with a product offering, for example, maybe that will induce the biggest viral cascades, will get the biggest influence. You know, those will be the mavens that make everyone else try to adopt whatever it is that they're doing. But if you were selling love, actually, and you pick central nodes in the network, you'd be out of luck. Because those are the Pulp Fiction fans right here in the middle of the network. They're not going to be interested, uh, in, generally speaking, in the Love Actually uh, product. Now this point uh, about the distinction between real influential ties and online and tenuous Facebook ties and other ties was driven home to me and James Fowler, my co-author in Connected, a few years ago in a very powerful way. Because one day this woman, raise your hands if you know this, Alana. So most of you know who she is. She's a rather well-known actress, and she was in a bunch of TV programs that were probably popular when you were in middle school, right, approximately. Um, and she's a hardworking, you know, good actress. And, uh, and at this time, uh, Milano had 1,050,000 Twitter followers uh, back uh, a few years ago. And very unexpectedly, on that particular day, Milano uh, sent a tweet about our book. Uh, connected, the surprising power of our social networks and how they shape our lives. And embedded in that little tweet is a link. And if you click on that link, it took you straight to the Amazon.com website for our book. Uh, click on that, it goes right to Amazon.com for the connected uh, book. And on that day, that tweet was then retweeted a million times. So two million people got a tweet on that day with a link to our book. And James and I, because we're neurotic, followed the sales rank of our book. <laughs> And, uh, and here on the y-axis is the sales rank. Up at the top is more sales. At the bottom is fewer sales. And on the x-axis is the day. And here's the day that Milano tweeted our book. <laughs> we estimate that we did not sell a single extra copy of our book. Not one. Even though two million tweets were sent out. Uh, on that particular day. In fact, some people looking at this data have said that actually when Milano tweeted our book, people raced to the bookstore to return our book. And that's why the curve is actually dropping uh, on, on the far uh, right. So this drives home the point again that actually interpersonal influence online might be very weak. Now if Milano had called up her friend and said, this is a good book, buy this book, 
it might have had an effect, right, your real friend. But all these sort of online followers, not so much. Now, there are other possible lessons to be drawn from this little anecdote. It's not a scientific experiment that I just showed you. It's just a little story. Some people say that, well, maybe if Milano had tweeted, for example, a lipstick product, like some cosmetic product, maybe it's product-specific uh, or influence, right? Or maybe it's something different. Maybe something about the book is too hard to expect in some of my book. Maybe it's not product-specific, but it's behavior-specific. You know, certain things will spread and not others, and so forth, um, and so on. So there's actually a lot of science or applied science being done in this area right now, trying to understand how can we understand virality, not just of pathogens, how can we understand virality of products, of ideas, of emotions, of other kinds of things that do spread in different sorts of ways. And in fact, online networks, Yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, and I, I, I gave like one or two days, but actually it didn't spike afterwards. It, 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 just, it just kept doing more of this. <laughs> Are you suggesting that I'm cooking the data for Sociology 126? How dare you? No, uh, no, it was, no, that's a good question. But you know, it's what, but it was the Amazon.com website. So unless someone saw her tweet and then hand wrote a note down to themselves, why this took a few days? Uh, really, we would have expected instant clicks. Now, what we didn't have, which we wish we have, uh, had had, and I asked Jeff Bezos about this, uh, is um, you know the clicks on uh, the book on the Amazon knows how many people clicked through that day and from where and whence they came. Now, we did not have that data uh, for that, so I couldn't know. Like maybe that would have been even more depressing. Like huge spike in clicks, no purchases. Uh, you know. Even more depressing. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that the clicks are not improving. Um, so, so online networks. Any other questions? So online networks facilitate interactions on a vast scale. Those we've already seen uh, influence for many processes appears to still depend on interactions uh, with real friends and not mere online connections. So if we're going to actually exploit the online world to facilitate or kind of uh, implement some kind of um, um, social marketing campaigns. We want to like, get people to donate more money. We want to sensitize people to malaria uh, in the developing world. We want to make Yale students more concerned about recycling or whatever it is that you're trying to do. We're going to need to give some deeper thoughts to how um, influence works online uh, and how that might or might not resemble a face to face uh, interpersonal influence. And in fact, one of the things you're going to need to do is have ways of measuring meaningful interactions if you're going to exploit online ties. Which online interactions represent real relationships where an influence might possibly be exerted? So the interactions have to be real or feel real. Okay? Either they have to be real relationships uh, online, or they have to feel like real relationships online. And how might they feel like real relationships online? One way they might feel like real relationships is, is if something is at stake. So think about when are you influenced by strangers online? If you both have something at stake, you both logged on because um, you're trying to find uh, uh, your couch surfing, and you want to find uh, a place to, to sleep, or you're selling a product, or you're looking for a sexual partner, or you're trying to manage your diabetes and you need advice from another person with diabetes, and you log on and a stranger gives you, or you have cancer, and you want to know about the side effects of a drug, and someone stranger says to you, don't take this drug, take this drug, you might follow that advice because you have something at stake in that relationship treating your, your problem, for example, or transacting business, or, or whatever it is. And when something is at stake, then, in fact, you can have a kind of interpersonal influence online, even between strangers. And finally, also, it's worth noticing that both leaders and followers are needed. So there's an obsession right now uh, with identifying who the influential people in uh, online networks are. And uh, while that's important to do, we don't just need influential people. We need influenceable people. You don't just need shepherds, you need sheep. You need to find a way of who's going to copy other people, right? How are you going to be able to identify clusters of individuals, not just so that if I get you, you change your behavior, but who's going to follow you? Who else is going to copy whatever it is that you're, uh, you're doing? So, um, so, uh, so these are some basic principles if we're going to think about how we might mobilize the online world to facilitate interpersonal influence around a diverse set of public health and public policy. Uh, objectives. Yeah. Are these interactions that only exist online? 
Uh, yeah, I'm just right now, I'm just talking about uh, online. That's right. So that's a good question. So these interactions exist online, and a subset of them presumably exist offline as well. And the argument is, is that certainly, like your true friends on Facebook, when you pick a movie and you say you like the movie, they're watching you, they're paying attention, they might be affected. But all your other Facebook quote unquote friends are, don't care about you, and they're not paying any attention. That's the argument. Or you might have to join a website where you're recommending movies to each other. People sign up and say, people like me, what movies do you like? Then you might be influenced by a stranger when you both have the like movie selection is the stakes uh, that are involved. Um, and smoking cessation online is another example. In fact, online smoking cessation efforts can be very successful. Uh, so, um, and I think we talked about this a few lectures ago when we talked about uh, uh, quit lines. In the olden days, when you were a smoker, you could sign up for a service and you were thinking of taking a drag on a cigarette. You could call some human being who would talk you down and you know get you through the nicotine craving. Now, of course, with the internet that can provide a similar service, thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who wish to quit smoking can log on and subscribe to different sorts of services. Many of these are free, or they have a kind of freemium model. Uh, and, uh, and so here's one example of a paper published by Nate Cobb a few years ago. There are about 8,000 people uh, here from a period of time in 2007. The red people are smokers, and the blue people are non-smokers. The green lines are closer ties, and the purple lines are sort of looser ties. And again, you can see clustering of smokers and non-smokers in the graph. And actually, there are all kinds of fascinating science that can be done, and, and uh, we're doing some of this in my lab, is, is can you figure out algorithmic ways to introduce newbies into the system such that you foster smoking cessation among the newbies, right? Your challenge here is, how do we get people to quit smoking? It's actually an important problem. So, who, where should we drop them? A new person comes in, where in this graph should we attach them to maximize the chance that they're going to uh, quit smoking and also that they're not going to foster reversion among the other people? So there's all kinds of interesting math you can do and applied math as well to figure out how you might go through uh, such an exercise to structure the interactions, to maximize, to take advantage of these old sociological principles of peer effects, normative influence, and so forth but now to do them in a, in a structural setting, in a network setting, so as to achieve a particular applied and desirable objective, which is to get people to quit smoking. And as I'm sure you can imagine, there are many similar illustrations, some of which we might think are really pro bono publico, they're good things, and other th you know, things which you know you might be getting people to buy widgets, for example, you know, might or might not be something you want to do, but the same technology um, can be applied. Now, incidentally, we've also used online networks of picture friends another way. I, what I didn't tell you is when we started that project about 10 years ago, the kind of uh, technology didn't exist that exists today to do these things. So we actually hired an army of undergraduates whose summer job it was, uh, was to scrape Facebook and, uh, and discern the ties. Like they had to manually code who was tagged with who, something now you could do with a few lines of Python script. And uh, so we had to, you know, do it manually. And while these poor undergraduates were paid to look at Facebook all summer, we also had them code whether people were smiling or not smiling in their profile photos, which again now could be done with facial recognition software. And so here the yellow dots are people with, you know, uh, I'm sorry, the blue dots are people with uh, frowny photos, like that was my photo back then, and the uh, and the, the yellow dots are people with happy photos. That's James Fowler's uh, photo back then. James, a very brilliant kind of even more than me. Kind of the guy, and uh, and uh, but I thought it was kind of better to affect this kind of severe look on Facebook. And so the uh, so the blue dots are frowny or neutral people, and I'm sorry, are, are frowny people, and the and the yellow dots are happy people, and the green dots are in between. And when you plot this network, you find once again clustering of smiling and non-smiling people, which actually spreads again to, or goes out to three degrees uh, of separation. We also found that uh, that smiling people are, are more likely to be in the middle of the network. Uh, again, the blue dots are more peripheral on average, and, uh, and we found that the smiley people have 20% more friends if you put like a smiley photo uh, of you uh, online. And in fact, in another paper we just published last week, uh, we found that happiness and other emotions spread between people in massive online social networks, again, if you restrict to real uh, connections. And with data from millions of Facebook users, we showed that rainfall directly influences the emotional content of their status messages, and it also affects the status messages of friends in other cities who are not experiencing rainfall. So what we did is, is we tried to do a natural experiment. What we would love to do 
is, is, is to form couplets of you guys, you and, you and your friend, and you and your friend, and you and your friend, and then take one of you away from the couplet and make you miserably unhappy, or make you really, really ecstatic. And actually, psychologists have some experimental manipulations they can do for this. They're a bit silly, but they work. Like, I can show you the Charlie Chaplin movie, and it'll improve your mood. Or I can make you win a little lottery. I can, I can, I can secretly connive to make you think like you're really blessed and you just want this little lottery payout, and it'll improve your mood. Or I can show you, like, Sophie's Choice, and you get, like, really unhappy. And, uh, and then I can test whether your mood is contagious and affects the other person's mood. So what I'd love to do is an experiment in which in each couplet, I randomly assign one person to an emotional state, and then saw, measure the emotional state subsequently in their friend. So everyone would be still. Of course, it's very hard to do that, and it's also very hard to do that on a huge scale. So instead, what we thought we would do is we would take advantage of a natural experiment, which is the weather. There's a huge old literature, well validated, that we are sadder when it rains, when the weather is bad. But what we were interested in is that when it rains on me, not what happens to my mood, we show that my mood gets worse in this Facebook project that we just published, but also to see how it affects my friends' moods. And what we did is, is we found couplets of people, millions of such couplets, where one person who lived in one city and another person lived in another city, and the weather was discordant between the two. And we saw how rainfall on you affects the status post of your friends. And we found that for every extra person in New York City that becomes sad because it rained in New York, at least one other person somewhere else in the United States also becomes sad, someone who lives in a sunny city on that particular uh, day. So for every one person affected directly, rainfall alters the emotional expression of about one to two other people, suggesting that online social networks may magnify the intensity of global emotional synchrony. And this goes back to the kind of uh, enormity that we discussed at the beginning. You know, it was always the case that our moves, like, have you ever gone, you raise your hands if you've ever arrived at a party and within five seconds knew if it was a good party. Just like walking, this is a great party. Or it was really sucks. Okay. So you can tell right away, right? Now what is happening there? Your emotional state is being synchronized with what's happening to the others. Okay? And so, um, but and, and that can always happen. But that party example is on a scale of 10, order 10 or order 100 uh, people, right? Now we can have order a million, order 10 million, order 100 million people, uh, potentially, whose uh, various attributes uh, can be synchronized because of the uh, uh, technology. Um, uh, okay. Um, now, this work with emotions and with altruism, uh, which we reviewed last time, we showed the experiment, the pay for experiment, both of which are so fundamental, got us to thinking about the evolutionary basis of networks themselves. So we've been studying human emotions, we're studying human altruism. Those are deep and fundamental properties of human beings, part of our human nature. And so we began to think about this topic. Uh, you know, we're thinking, well, maybe there's something in human evolution that sheds light on the structure of human social networks. Now, human social networks, wherever they've been mapped, always look strikingly similar. Always look like the pictures that I've been showing you. They have a structure such as this. But they never look like this. Why not? I mean, why didn't we evolve as a species to create a social network in the form of a regular lattice uh, such as this? The striking patterns of human social networks, their ubiquity and their apparent purpose, beg the question of whether we evolved to have networks and to have particular kinds of social networks in the first place. So now the questions become, why do we form networks in the first place, and why do they have the structure that they do? Now to understand this, we need to dissect network structure a little bit first. So first of all, notice that in this network, every position is isomorphic to every other position. Every person in this graph has, uh, has eight friends, and every one of their friends has eight friends. And, uh, and if you took this surface and you wrapped it around the surface of a sphere, or more properly three dimensions, a torus, a donut, every position would be equally distant from the periphery as every other position uh, in this graph. But of course, real social networks don't look like that at all. They look like this. In real social networks, there's heterogeneity in the position that people can occupy. Different positions are different. And I can, I'd like to cultivate some intuition about that and also define a few terms so I can shed some light on this topic. So first of all, notice that node B, these are college kids and their friends, node B has four connections, and node D has six connections. 
And this is known as the degree of a node. Uh, and people generally know this about themselves. You have four friends. You have six friends. I have no friends. People know how many friends they have about themselves. Okay? Now look at nodes C and D. C and D have both have six connections. They have degree six. But there's a difference between the two. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network? C or D? D. D, right? So it's pretty obvious you'd rather be D, because you have the intuition that D is going to be less likely to get whatever's spreading and less likely to get it early in the course of the epidemic. He's isolated on the corner of the network, okay? Now who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip is spreading through the network? C. So you have the intuition it's better to be C in the middle. Now people often ask me when they hear me talk about networks, what's the best position to be in in networks? And I give the very unsatisfying answer, which is it depends. And you already are beginning to see how it depends. Because it depends, for instance, on what's spreading. If Ebola is spreading through the network, it's really good to be on the periphery. You know, if money is spreading through the network, it's good to be on the center. So it depends, for instance, on what's spreading. Now look at nodes A and B. Uh, a, uh, a has four connections and so does B. But the difference between the two is that the friend of a friend of A's is back again a friend of A's. Whereas the friend of a friend of B's is not a friend of B's. This is known as transitivity or transitive closure in a graph, okay? Now, if you were a prehistoric human and you needed to go out and kill a mastodon, who would you rather be, A or B? Raise your hands if you'd rather be A. Raise your hands if you'd rather be B. Okay, you'd rather be A, in fact, that's correct. And the reason is all your friends are friends with each other. You can collaborate, it's like a sports team. Let's go out and kill the damn thing, all right? Let's work together and we'll kill the mastodon. But then again, if the challenge is not to kill the mastodon, but to find the mastodon, it's much better to be B. Because in the case of A, your friend's friend is you. Do you know where the mastodon is? Or do you know where the mastodon is? It comes right back to you, right? But in the case of B, your friend's friend can reach further into the graph and get the location information about the location of predators uh, or prey, for instance. This is an idea I'm going to come back to uh, next lecture as well. And in fact, what we did is, is we did a, a very a, a, a classic kind of uh, scientific uh, design called a twin study design uh, a few years ago to look at the heritability uh, of these three traits. Let me show you how a uh, twin study design works. You can use this to study things like height, eye color, uh, you know, religiosity. Actually, we talked about this a few lectures ago. We talked about religion. Um, so, um, so in a twin study design, you take monozygotic twins. So, uh, you know, identical twins. Uh, you form pairs of them, and you take same-sex dizygotic twins. They have to be same-sex because otherwise, I mean, these are always same-sex, so you want same-sex dizygotic twins. And you measure something in both twins. For example, you measure the height of this twin and the height of this twin, and you see how similar they are. And you measure the height of this twin and the height of this twin, and you see how similar they are. And if these are more similar than these, and conditional on the assumptions in the model, for example, that twins are raised in the same kind of environment as each other, the fact that these are more similar than these and the extent to which they are more similar gives you a clue about the degree to which that trait is heritable. So if height is very, very similar among identical twins and not very similar about uh, fraternal twins, you're going to think hmm, height may have a partially genetic basis. And you can do the same thing with network properties, as we did. You can map the networks of monozygotic twins and you look at these networks and you say that they're pretty similar. This guy has one, two, three, four, five, six friends. This guy has uh, four, five friends. And the amount of transitivity in their networks is very similar. Here, you can see that they're different. This guy has fewer friends, and they're much more interlocked, for instance, on this side. And if you do that, as we did, you find the following results. So on the y-axis here is the percent of the variance explained with heritability. And these are the three traits that I just introduced you to. Incidentally, there are many more mathematical summaries, many more parameters of networks that you can study. These are just the three first, simplest ones. And what you find here is that 46% of the variation in the number of friends you have in your degree can be explained by your genes. So this is not very surprising or shocking. Um, what this says is, you know, some people are born shy and some people are born gregarious. People vary in their taste for friendship. Right? Some of us want many friends, some of us don't want friends, and that's partially here. Okay? Not, not a big shock. But we also found that the two higher order properties are also partially here. 
as shown in the second bar, over 47% of the variation in how many friends you have can be explained by your genes. This is one of the most bizarre results, one of the more bizarre results that come out of my lab in the last five years. What I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether you two guys are friends with each other depends on my genes. How can that be? We think the reason is that people vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. Some people knit the network around them together, and some people in kind of world collide theory keep their friends apart. So this person and the previous person may be introducing all his friends to each other, and this person is not, for example. So and in fact, finally, 29%, for reasons I won't go into, 29% of the variation in how central you are in the network may also be heritable. So where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. And the fundamental reality of our desire for connection and our susceptibility to influence, it turns out, has always been with us. Now, it's important to sort all this out. And I'm going to make now a classic sociological argument. It's important to sort all this out because genes might be associated with both network topology and with behavioral outcomes. And in fact, interpersonal effects might depend on both in ways that are very interesting. So for example, lots of scientists are out there doing work that shows that different sorts of genes on the dopamine or serotonin pathway, for example, these are neurotransmitters, have, have lots to do with all kinds of behaviors. How obese you are, whether you smoke, how happy you are, your voting propensity, how altruistic you are. Genes affect these behaviors, OK? And in the last lecture, we saw that social networks can also affect those behaviors. And now I just showed you that genes might affect social networks. So maybe one of the ways that people aren't paying attention to, but that they should, that genes affect human behaviors, is not by what they do inside your body, but by what they do outside your body. Maybe, in fact, these genes are working not because they're modifying your serotonin levels in your brain, and that's what makes you depressed or not. Maybe that gene is working by changing your taste for friendship. And it's the existence of the friends that in turn make you happy or unhappy. So part of the effect of the genes might be sociological and not physiological. It might work outside your body and not inside your body. And this is methodologically important because models, that biological or statistical models, that seek to understand the impact of genes on behaviors that fail to take into account the sociology might misspecify the models and overestimate the impact of genes inside your body by neglecting this backdoor pattern. Yes, Amelia. Um, have studies been done to control for social networks and see if genes Not yet. We're doing, we're doing that in the lab. Yeah, that's a good question. But yeah, that would be an obvious thing to begin to try to partition and see well, how much of the effect. And of course, it will vary from case to case. You know, Something like eye color, for example, there's going to be no outside path uh, here, right? But other kinds of traits will, will vary. Even something like height might be partially via this path. Because for example, if you pick friends who are very athletic and don't smoke and eat well and you copy those behaviors, that will improve your height, right? So some of the effect that it might have, even for something like that, which is very heritable. Other questions? Are there, is there, there are a few behavior genetics classes at Yale, right? Has anyone taken a class like that here? There's one in the psychology department. I think there's one in the evolutionary biology department. Those are interesting things to think about as an intellectual field. OK. So perhaps, in fact, one way our genes might affect our behaviors is by uh, inducing changes in our social network structure. And this, in turn, raises still further question about, what, about why networks might be genetically encoded in the first place. And we think that part of this must be because networks enhance our fitness. And by fitness here, I mean Darwinian fitness. The, you know, your uh, probability of survival or reproduction. So, um, and so more, more recent work of ours has shown, in fact, that, uh, there are, there, that there are all kinds of deeper ways in which this phenomenon plays out. It turns out you're more likely to befriend people that you resemble genetically, and this has some interesting consequences for a topic known as kin, uh, kin selection, which I won't go into, into today. But, but the basic idea is that there are deep reasons that we have friends and there are deep reasons that we prefer the company of people we resemble. In fact, I would invite you to reflect on the following question. Why do we have friends at all? I mean, think about that. Uh, very few species on the planet
and it did this. Us, other primates, elephants, and cetaceans. That's it. Social animals. And, uh, but other animals don't have friends, don't have long-term non-reproductive unions with non-kin conspecifics. We do. There's something very interesting and deep about our tendency uh, to form friendships, to form uh, social networks. And not only do we have networks, but we prefer the company of people we resemble. Now, that's a very deep, fundamental aspect of human beings. Sometimes it gets very depressing when we line up along racial or ethnic or other lines. But, um, and forget our common humanity, but it's very common. Tall people prefer the company of tall people, Yaleys prefer the company of Yaleys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, um, but the question is to ask why, why that's the case. And uh, most of the explanations right now, it, to my eye, um, in this research field, border on what I would call a tautology. Who knows what a tautology is? Raise your hands if you've heard that word, tautology. It comes from the Greek word tafto, which means rapid. A tautology is a rapid conclusion. So a tautological argument means that ipso facto, A must lead to B, bang, bang. There's no thought or, you know, it doesn't make much sense. It's like they're part and parcel of the same thing. So, um, so, so right now, the explanations for what are, or is a kind of circular argument is a tautology. So, um, so, uh, so the argument about why people prefer the company people who resemble right now sort of goes like this. Why do I prefer the company people who resemble? I'm more comfortable. I get along better with people that resemble me. Why are you more comfortable with them? Because they resemble me, right? It's just a circular argument. But it's interesting to ask why. Why do we all feel this way, that we prefer the company of people uh, we resemble? Why makes us feel good? Be the company of people we resemble by and large. Now, if it's the oh, sorry, does someone have a question that I missed that I skipped over? Yeah, Rachel? Yeah, I'm just wondering how, like, you're saying that only specific species have friendships, but what about, like, interspecies friendships? Like, yeah, we're writing, we have a book we're working on right now where we talk about interspecies friendships, actually. I, I don't know what I think about interspecies friendships. There are all these things online, which I've been looking at all these cute animal videos. And in fact, <laughs> if you see these and you want to send them to me, do you know there's the elephant and the dog and there's the hippo and the turtle and there's like like there are all these like there's allegedly the lion and the and the and the springbok the baby springbok and uh, people think that they're really being friendly no cats play with their food the lion yes is playing with the baby springbok and as soon as the camera stops she will eat it uh, it's not just caressing it and patting it lovingly you know it's like a cat playing with a mouse uh, so. Uh, so there, there are lots of uh, uh, examples like that online, uh, and I, I haven't decided yet whether I think those are real interspecies friendships or not. Most of those species do not actually form friendships within their own species. Now, this is different than pack animals, horses, uh, dogs, and things that move like bird flocks. Also different than the new social insects, right? Termites, uh, bees, uh, ants, they're clones, right? They all descend from the same queen. They're not non-kin, they're kin. Same with the animal, the dog packs, most of the people well, most of the other dogs in the dog pack that a dog interacts with are related to it, are its brother, or sister, or cousin. Yeah, right behind you. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, Coco the gorilla, um, how and that habit friend? I don't know if you. The kitten, the all ball, the little kitten friend? The speaking oh, Coco? Yeah. yeah, all ball, yeah. Unbelievable story. Yeah. That, but he's a primate, or she, right. or Coco. So you think that she actually was? Yes, I think she. I don't know whether she thought of the cat as a friend. It's a very famous case of a, of a gorilla that was taught from uh, early life to sign. And this gorilla had 400 uh, signs and would communicate with sign language with her uh, keepers. And, uh, and actually, we know that the gorilla was forming language because, I don't remember if it was a he or a she, actually, the gorilla. Uh, yeah. She, I think, yeah, but she would, uh, would uh, form new words by joining together signs. And when one day she was given a kitten, she flipped. And she held the kitten, and then she made up a new sign for the kitten, which was all bald. Uh, like a little fuzzy ball, you know, kitten. Oh, I know. So, but, I, but, 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 I, but that's a different, I think, I think Coco thought that all ball was a toy, like a really nice, wonderful toy. Not uh, like the way you would look at a stuffed bear or something. Stuffed animals in your door. Uh, we can check with your roommates on the grass too. That's it. Uh, but the way you would look at a stuffed animal, uh, you know, not the way you would look at you know your sister or your roommate, for, for instance. Okay. So if social networks have biological and genetic antecedents and evolutionary significance, it begs the question of how ancient the structure is, or whether we can document such structural features in human populations living in non-modernized settings. So the idea is that if, if 
network structure is partly in our genes. If we could go back 10,000 years and look at human populations that lived like we did during the Pleistocene, their networks should be just like ours. Okay? Now, we can't go back 10,000 years uh, to the Pleistocene, um, but uh, we can do the next best thing, which is to go and find a modern human population that lives like we did during the Pleistocene. And so what we decided to do is we were going to map the social networks of the Hadza hunter-gatherers. Hadza hunter-gatherers are only about 1,000 of them left. Only about 500 of them live like, uh, uh, in the traditional way. Uh, I'm sorry, only about 1,000 of them left. Only, only about 500 of them are adults that live in the traditional way. These people hunt and gather for their food. They have no material possessions to speak of. They sleep under the stars. Uh, and they move from place to place. Uh, they have no agriculture. Uh, and move camps every six weeks uh, looking for, uh, for food. And, uh, and these are 17 camps around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania, uh, where they live. And, uh, and a few summers ago, uh, one of my postdocs, Corin Apicella, uh, spent the summer sleeping among scorpions and driving a Land Rover all around 4,000 square kilometers of Lake Ayasi trying to find Hadza. And what we had done is, in collaboration with one of the world's most famous ethnographers of the Hadza, uh, 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 Frank Marlowe, is we, um, we created a photographic census of the Hadza, a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we took these Hadza Facebook posters into the field, and every adult Hadza we found, we asked that person to identify uh, their friends, to point to their friends. And there's Corin uh, in the lower uh, right. And, um, and we asked them, we discerned the ties between people in a number of ways. One thing we did is, is we did what we call camping networks. Now, when you're trying to define ties amongst modernized populations, like for example in the United States, one of the classic questions you ask when I'm trying to figure out who your friends are is, who do you spend free time with, right? That's like a big indicator of who your friends are. Or, who do you discuss important matters with? That's a big indicator. Those are the so-called name generators the way you identify people's social ties. You can ask those questions, or many other questions. But if you ask Hadza who they spend their free time with, they've got a lot of free time. And so you don't get a lot of distinction up there. So we had to come up with different ways of identifying meaningful social relationships among the Hadza. And one of the questions we asked was, with whom would you like to live after this camp? And we restricted it to same-sex friendships because the Hadza don't practice homosexuality. And we wanted to see uh, people who are uh, non-sexual talks, like we didn't want men to identify women they wanted to have sex with in the next camp, and that's who they wanted to camp with her, and vice versa, women with men. So we said, same-sex uh, friendships, who would you like to camp with in the next camp? Um, and they could choose up to 10 individuals. And then we did something else, which I thought was kind of cute, is the Hadza love honey. They, they get honey, but it's very hard to get honey in this part of Africa. And to get honey, you have to climb up a tree and be stung by bees, but they love it, they love honey. And so we went to our local Costco, and we bought thousands of honey sticks. See the little honey stick there? And we took the honey sticks to, to Hadza land, which was not easy to do. And we uh, did a number of things with these honey sticks. But one of the things we did is, is we gave each Hadza respondent three sticks of honey, and we said, you cannot keep this for yourself. You must give it to someone else anonymously. To whom will you give it? So we mapped an altruistic gift network uh, amongst the Hadza. And what we found, uh, this is the camping network for Hadza female, and when we inspect this network, we can inspect it both visually uh, and uh, statistically, we can look at this network. What we found when we studied the structure of, of this network was that the Hadza networks look just like ours. With every mathematical parameter and every visual technique we had in order to study these networks, we found that they were indistinguishable from our networks. They had the same degree distribution, which is a kind of mathematical way of summarizing how many people have one friend, two friends, three friends, four friends, and so forth. The same amount of homophily, which is the love of light that we discussed before. The same decay with geographic distance, you know, the probability of being a friend with someone declines the further and further away they are. The same amount of transitivity, which I just talked about a few moments ago, a few slides ago, which is the probability that any two of your friends will be friends with each other. If I ask you guys to identify your friends, your real friends, and then I pick two of them at random, the probability that the two of them are friends is about 0.2 to 0.4. 20 to 40% of your of pairs of your friends will uh, be friends with each other. They have this, another property called degree of sortativity I won't go into, and also they evince reciprocity. This paper was just published a year or so ago. Um, and so even though in the last 10,000 years we've invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telephony, our networks 
look just like pods and networks. There's something deep and fundamental about the structure of human social interaction that is not effaced or modified by all of this uh, technology in the last 10,000 uh, years. Um, and in fact, um, this degree of sortativity property uh, is a property which is that popular friends, pre popular people preferentially befriend other popular people, and unpopular people preferentially befriend other unpopular people. Uh, and actually, this particular property has some advantages in social networks. It, that property gives the graph uh, epidemic resistance. So that property reduces the likelihood that a pathogen can take root in the population. Uh, so that might be a reason we have high transitivity, uh, high uh, degree assertivity. Transitivity helps to enforce social norms. So, um, so if you, if your friends are friends with each other, they can be more effective at forcing you to do something than if your friends are not friends with each other. Um, and um, and uh, and homophily can facilitate collective action. So it may be the case that preferential attachment to similar individuals. If if I'm trying to do something as a group. And I form a team with other people who are like me. The argument is that my capacity for empathy or insight or theory of mind is higher. So if you have a group of people who resemble each other, my actions can stand as proxies for what others might do, which makes it easier for us to band together and do something as a team. So homophily might be related to the capacity of individuals to work together to achieve an objective. And so all of these three properties and others that we evince, the Hadza also evince. And in fact, in fact, I think in a very real sense, the spread of germs is the price we pay for the spread of information. We come near each other to benefit from each other's knowledge. You put your hand in the fire, and you tell me don't do that, Nicholas. You pay all the cost of putting your hand in the fire, and I get almost as much benefit as you do, right? That's pretty impressive, social learning. And I come near you to acquire this benefit of social learning. It's a huge benefit. You can learn because I studied. That's what's happening right now, actually. Uh, uh, social learning. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but in coming near you, I expose myself to the risk, for instance, of con uh, contracting germs from you or being, or being treated violently by you. So I have to weigh the benefits and the costs of interpersonal connection. And the argument is that across evolutionary time, this type of calculus has occurred in the evolution of human uh, social networks. So social networks are very deeply embedded in our evolutionary heritage, despite the fact that in the last 10,000 years, we have done, our culture and our technology have changed so much. Now we're affected not just by what's flowing through the network, uh, we're affected in another way by networks uh, as well. So. Um, so here's an example uh, from, uh, 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 because the actual structure of the network matters uh, as well. And here's just one example of how network structure might matter as distinct from what's flowing through the network. And this is the difference between connection and contagion that we will also revisit uh, the next time, and that's discussed in the book. So last lecture, we talked about contagion, how things spread in networks. This is an example of how connection might affect you. This is work done by another sociologist, uh, Brian Lucy at North uh, Western University. Brian became very interested in the success or failure of Broadway musicals. Okay, now, I don't know why Brian would be interested in this topic. I'm interested in Broadway musicals, but Brian did. And so he assembled a data set of 326 Broadway musical production companies. The, the producer, the director, the actors, the musicians, and he mapped the networks of those companies, and he computed a quantity similar to transitivity known as density. So here is a Broadway musical production company, a little cartoon of the six people. And this person is connected to these five people. And amongst those five people are five times four divided by two, ten possible connections, none of which are present, zero percent density. And in this graph here, four of the ten are present, 40 percent density. And here, all ten of the ties are present, 100 percent density. And then Uzi plotted on the far right the density on the x-axis versus the success rate of the Broadway musical on the y-axis and he measured success in terms of how much money the Broadway musicals made or what fraction of the reviews were positive. And he found that if nobody knew each other from before, 0% density, the show was a flop. And he found that if everybody knew each other from before, the show was a flop. And the optimal performance of this team, of this group, was achieved with middling levels of density. So if you want to put a group together to go hunt and kill a mastodon, 
You need people who can find the mastodon, who don't know each other, and people who can work together to kill the mastodon, who do know each other. So people can be organized in particular uh, and connected in particular ways, and this can affect what they are able to do. Now, incidentally, this is different than the Behrman study that was in the reading for today. I do not want you to take home the message from this slide that everything in groups is optimized in middle link transitivity. That's not the case. In this example, it's the case. The general intellectual point here is that structure matters. The details will vary from case to case. So in the reading for today, in the Behrman reading, what Behrman looked at is, is he looked at the transitivity in girls' friendship networks. Young women, do their friends know each other or not know each other? Transitivity. And what he found, and here he plotted the risk of suicidal ideation. Did the girls think of killing themselves? And he found that if the girls' friends uh, knew, uh, did not know each other, they had a very high rate of thinking of killing themselves, and that that fell monotonically as the probability of the girls' friends knowing each other increased. So if you're a young woman and your friends are friends with each other, you don't think of killing yourself. If your friends are not friends with each other, you think of killing yourself. Right? That's the argument. And it's like, if you two can't get along, I'm going to shoot myself. Uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, argument. Okay? So bear that it's a monotonically declining function, not a parabolic function. Now we've also begun to study networks of doctors uh, in our lab. And to do this, we, we map the networks using the metric of shared patients. Um, so this is something else. It's known as a bipartite network. A two-part network. A bipartite network has two kinds of nodes. Okay? So here are doctors, four doctors, one, two, three, four, and here are their patients in yellow, A through K. So doctor one sees patients A, B, C, D, and E, and doctor two sees these other patients, and so forth. Well, you can take these data and, and project them onto a so-called unipartite plane. Basically, you can make a map of the doctors where the lines indicate how many patients they share in common. So you draw ties between people based on whether or not they share patients. And they can share a few patients, no patients. Doctors one and three share no patients. Doctors one and two share two patients. These guys are in a little transient triangle. They each share one patient. And we've done this for the whole country, looking at millions, hundreds of thousands of doctors and millions of patients and how many they share in common. Here's one network map of physicians practicing in a single hospital. Uh, so here are about 1,000 doctors. And this is in a hospital in upstate New York. This hospital has about um, 300,000 inpatient days. Uh, and here we color the dots according to the specialty of the physician. The red dots are primary care physicians, otherwise they are specialists. And if you look at this network, you can see that the central position in the network, centrality, high centrality, is not occupied by the primary care doctors. The specialists are in the center of this network. And in this hospital, when you care for patients who die, the patients who die in the last two years of life cost $100,000, and they spend 48 days in the hospital. But in an otherwise identical hospital in upstate New York that has 300,000 patient days and 1,000 doctors, but a different structure of their doctors, now the red dots, the primary care specialists, are in the middle. Here, the patients spend half as much money, $46,000, and spend half as many days, 25 days in the hospital. So the structure of the doctor interactions, the structure of the network, has implications for the experience of the patients that come to that hospital. It's not just who the doctors are, it's how the doctors are connected to each other that's important in determining the nature of the functionality of the group. How this group of doctors in this hospital acts depends on how the doctors are connected to each other. In fact, we've recently begun to expand our work on the diffusion of ideas and innovation, looking at healthcare providers more generally. This is a graph of 651 doctors in Raleigh, Durham, and whether or not they prescribe an anti-diabetic drug called Genuvia. Here we make the dot size proportional to how much Genuvia they prescribe. A bigger dots are bigger prescribers, and we color the dots orange if they ever prescribe Genuvia, otherwise yellow. And if you look at this image, you see clusters of Genuvia prescribers and non-prescribers. And amazingly, these clusters also go to three degrees of separation. And you see that, in fact, there are this little peninsula of doctors down here who aren't prescribing this innovation. And maybe if you could talk to this doctor and get him to change his mind about Genuvia, you could open up a flow of prescribing practice down through that peninsula. So innovations about safety practices, drug use, test ordering, and so much else flows through networks, including through networks of doctors, and understanding network structure can give you insight into how individual agency 
you would think the doctors are deciding on their own whether to prescribe it. No, the doctors are being affected as well uh, by their networks. Or you can treat hospitals as nodes on the network. And again, this picks up on the idea of big data that we're beginning to introduce and look at the hospitals in geographic space and look at the transfer of patients between the hospitals as a way of discerning ties. And here's what a map of the flow of patients across American hospitals for a whole year uh, looks like. Yeah? I just had a question on the last slide. I was wondering if you knew pharmaceutical companies have been using this type of data. Yes, they are. And so, in fact, this technology that we invented was licensed by Harvard to a startup company uh, uh, which uh, uh, uses this technology and arms both sides. So they go to the pharmaceutical companies and say, would you like to get doctors to prescribe these drugs? Yes. Then they go to insurance companies and say, would you like to get doctors to switch the generics? Yes. And so there's like an arms race going on now to get uh, to, to, to do that kind of stuff. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, so I just want to close uh, with one sort of um, set of important sort of conceptual arguments drawn from sociology and the social sciences that are relevant to some of the ideas we've been discussing today. Next time we're going to be talking about social network interventions in the following time about one of the ideas that I think is the most important idea in the social sciences, the idea of social capital. We'll come back to that. But before getting there, I want to set the stage with another way, another kind of conceptual point that's a key intellectual point that's been a kind of light motif through the class from the last uh, few lectures. Because I think social networks offer a new way to understand human behaviors and human societies. Now, one classic way of understanding collective human behavior is to examine the choices and actions of individuals. For example, we can see markets, elections, and riots as the mere byproduct of individuals' decisions to buy and sell goods, cast a ballot, or express anger. The classic example of this approach, which is known as methodological individualism, which we introduced right at the beginning, is provided by Adam Smith's conception of markets as the simple sum of individuals' willingness to supply or, uh, or demand a good. So an 18th century conceptualization of human social system, like from Adam Smith, looks at the social system as a collection of individuals who are acting on their own, and as a result of their individual actions, you get some kind of collective uh, phenomenon. Now, in the 19th century, another classic way of understanding collective human behavior uh, was propounded. And this dispenses with individuals and focuses exclusively on groups delineated, say, by class or race, each of which have collective identities that cause people in these groups to act in concert. So some scholars in this tradition, such as Karl Marx, believe that groups have their own consciousness, imbuing them with indivisible personality that cannot be deduced or understood from the actions of its members. So Marx, unlike Smith, thinks that there's something different about groups that doesn't reside in individuals. That, and the group has this property that's not necessarily present in individuals. And others have focused, in fact, on the primacy of group culture. For example, sociologist Emil Durkheim, with whom we introduced the course, argued that the relatively constant rates of suicide in different religious groups across time could not be explained by the actions of any individuals, since the groups had an enduring reality that long outlasted their members. How was it, he wondered, that people came and went, individuals came and went, but the suicide rate in French Protestants stayed the same? And his argument is there's something about being a French Protestant that's independent of being an individual that contributes to the seemingly individual trait of taking your own life. And this idea is known as methodological holism. And this approach sees social phenomena as having a totality that is distinct from individuals and that cannot be understood just by studying uh, individuals. Methodological holism. Different way of seeing uh, human social systems. Now, 20th century social scientists often focused on a different kind of take that partially merged these two perspectives, focusing on how the membership of individuals in groups via the sharing of particular traits or attributes could explain their behavior and collective phenomena. So we start partitioning people. We say, oh, these are blacks, and these are whites, and these are rich, and these are poor, and these are rural, and these are urban. And we say, oh, if you have that trait, then you're going to be likely to evince this other kind of behavior. Okay? So it's a different kind of way than what we're saying. 
But I actually think that these two traditions, individualism and holism, shed some light on the human condition, but they also miss, miss something essential. And I think in the 21st century, we have a kind of different way of thinking about these types of collective uh, social action problems that we've been discussing so far. In contrast to both individualism and holism, the science of social networks offers an entirely uh, new way of understanding human society because it is about both individuals and groups, and it is indeed about how the former become the latter, right? How do you assemble a group of people into a, how do you assemble a group of individuals into a group, and how does that process actually play out? Interconnections between people give rise to phenomena that are not present in individuals and not reducible to their solitary desires and actions. So, methodological individualism and methodological holism. Individualism seeks explanations for social phenomena, such as social class, markets, power, institutions, and so forth, as being formulated as or reducible to the characteristics or actions of individuals. And methodological holism sees each social entity, group, institution, network, and so forth, as having the totality, excuse me, as having the totality that is distinct from and not understood, understandable by merely studying its individual uh, component uh, elements. Um, and this study, in my judgment of social networks, is in fact part of a much broader, what I call, assembly project in modern science. For the last 400 years, swept by a kind of reductionistic fervor and tremendous success, scientists have been purposefully examining ever smaller bits of nature in order to understand the whole. So we disassembled life into organs, then cells, then molecules, then genes, and so forth. People are now beginning to study van der Waals interaction forces between base pairs and DNA, which is really like an absurd, not absurd, it's fascinating and important, but it's like a, such a tiny, tiny part of going down to a tiny level uh, to try to understand uh, life, for example. Uh, and we disassembled uh, matter into atoms and then nuclei and then subatomic particles. And we've invented everything from microscopes to super colliders to help us to understand ever smaller bits of nature. But in fact, it's clear that across many disciplines, scientists are now trying to put the parts back together, whether macromolecules into cells, neurons into brains, species into ecosystems, nutrients into foods, or people into networks. You're seeing the emergence of things like neuroscience, for example, systems biology, social network analysis. These are all scientific sort of uh, efflorescences that are trying to put parts back together to understand how the whole comes to be greater than the sum of its parts. In fact, scientists are turning their attention to how and why the parts fit together and to the rules that govern interconnection and coherence. And I think that understanding the structure and function of social networks and the phenomenon of emergence of social networks, which we'll come back to, uh, is part of this, frankly, awesome uh, scientific movement. Okay, any questions left for today? Yeah. What's your name again? Uh, Shannon. Shannon. I have a question regarding the rankings of online. What is spread online? So, when you look at the uh, effect of weather on the like, these parts, do you look at their friends and friends and say, like, you are one of the changes, uh, the you know, someone who's talking to you look at the friends? Yes. You could go even further, that's right. You could go to two degrees, but the, it'll decay. The effect will decay. So, yeah. Why do you ask that? I mean, it's, you only need to go one step to, to test the emotional contagion example. Uh, oh, but, oh, but in other work we've done online, we've looked at the three degrees thing. For example, in another paper I didn't present to you, we looked at voting behavior. So we find that if you vote, it changes the probability that your friends will vote, your friends or friends will vote, and, that, and the effect spreads uh, through the graph. So transmissible. Yes, I think that's a good point. And so, and of course, there are analogies to pathogens, right? Some pathogens extinguish very rapidly as they move through the graph, and others do not. So that's right. And one of the things that's so interesting to me right now, I don't have time to do it. Well, maybe I have a few minutes. Um, yeah, I'm going to take. I have four minutes. I'm going to take it. I'm going to tell you a little fable. Have I ever told you about the islands and the sexually transmitted diseases? No. No. Okay. So bear with me, because you learn something. So. Um, so this is one of the areas where the scientific frontier is right now, the question that you asked. 
So, um, so imagine you have two islands in the Pacific, and there are 100 people on this island and 100 people on this island, okay? And on this island, everyone is having sex with everyone else. It's a fully saturated graph. It's like an orgy, okay, on this island. And in this island, it's like a monastery. Nobody's having sex with anybody else, okay? So two different islands. But in either island, is there an epidemic? Okay? Nothing's, there's no sexually transmitted disease. They're all fine. Now a sailor washes up on the shore, and he has a sexually transmitted disease. In this island, he has sex with one person, and in this island, he has sex with one person. Where do you get the bigger epidemic? Over here, right? So this is what we talked about the last time. The social networks magnify whatever they are seated with. But they must be seated. The fact that they're interconnected here magnifies the epidemic. You get a huge outbreak of STD. But they must be seated. Prior to the sailor coming, you get an epidemic. Okay, first idea. So the structure matters of the network. Now, imagine that um, you have two islands, and everyone is having sex with everyone else over here, and everyone is having sex with everyone else over here. But now, everyone here is immunocompetent. Their immune systems are functional. And here, everyone is immunocompromised. Their immune systems don't work. Sailor washes up on shore on both islands, has sex with one person. Where do you get the bigger epidemic? Or here, immunocompromised, right? So here, their immune systems don't work, the epidemic spreads better. So it's not just the structure of the graph that affects whether people have the uh, epidemic emerges, it's attributes of the individuals themselves, something about the people in the network that is also important. So far, so good. Now I'm going to tell you a piece of basic biology. If you have sex with someone that has active syphilis, who knows what your probability of getting syphilis is? One out of three. If you have sex with someone with active HIV, who knows what your probability of getting HIV is? Some of them must know. One out of 500, approximately. Depends if you're a man or a woman and what kind of sexual action you have. But anyway, it's about one out of 500. So syphilis is much more transmissible. OK, now you have two different islands. 100 people here, 100 people here. Everyone's having sex, everyone's having sex. Everyone's immunocompetent, everyone's immunocompetent. Sailor watches up on the shore. Here he has syphilis, here he has HIV. Where do you get the bigger epidemic? Syphilis. So it's not just the structure of the network that matters. It's not just attributes of the individuals that matter. It's attributes of the thing itself. The thing itself matters and affects the epidemic. Now, when it comes to pathogens, we've got 100 years of biology that can help guide us in making predictions about whether something will be a big epidemic. Is it expressing hydrophilic proteins on its surface? How big is it? How antigenic is it? And so forth. But when it comes to ideas, we have no idea. I, if you show me a list of pathogens, I can make some guesses. If you show me a list of ideas of which these things will spread, I can't tell you now. So there's huge scientific effort right now being invested in trying to understand what increases virality, what makes some ideas not just engaging. I'm not just interested in whether you're engaged by the idea. I'm interested in whether you tell others about the idea. And that's a whole other kettle of fish. It's a really interesting problem. See you next time.